morning, everybody. We're in First Peter chapter two. Going to start uh, another uh, part of this household uh, uh, code section. Uh, we are moving from our place in society as Christians to uh, to the household, more more specifically, and in this case, the relationship between uh, slaves and masters. Uh, but let's first go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness toward us, your grace and your love and the mercy that we receive through Christ. Bless us now as we study your word and send your Holy Spirit to guide us in our thinking and speaking that we may learn to know your will and to appreciate your love for us in a new way, strengthened in the faith and encouraged in a life that's obedient to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This passage uh, was is introduced by uh, a call to people who belong to a uh, a different world, heaven, uh, to live in a in a particular way in this world. Um, and so, the first section of this household code uh, was all about how to behave as a Christian. And, uh, in, in respect to society, as members of the political order. And you remember it said in verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. And uh, we're going to, by the time we, when we start in chapter three, uh, we're going to move further into the relationship uh, between husbands and wives but at verse 18 here in chapter two, we move into the household. Uh, and um, we, we've got to deal with this first uh, before we, we get to the, the husband-wife relationship. So uh, I will read 18 to the end. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Um, question uh, from 21 onwards, it isn't the case in mine, but do any of you in your translations uh, have 21 to 25 set apart from the rest of the text, made to it formatted differently, almost as though it were um, a poem? And any of you have that? Just in 22. Just in 22. Yeah. Just 22. Uh, and, and then it's back to normal when you get to 23. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's it. A anybody have from 22 to 25, say? You just have the one verse set apart? Mm -hmm. That's so hard. I want to see that. That's <laughs> right. So this is an IV. You got an IV. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I think. Uh, if anybody has uh, RSV, anybody have, um, well, I hope you, yeah, funny, funny. Uh, if anyone has RSV, you see a doctor immediately, uh, you get that man a ZPAC. Uh, but the revised standard version, the Pinko Kami version, um, that, that's what my New Testament professor always called it. Because uh, they intentionally, right, would, would always err on the side of uh, a translation that would show Jesus not to be divine. Right, or, you know, they, they intentionally uh, would, uh, translate uh, the prophecy of the virgin birth as the maid, the maiden will receive and bear a son. Uh, and 
to take the the the, 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 the aspect of virginity away, unless one thinks that it was a, a miracle. Uh, RSV is not upset. What's that? RSV is not upset. It's not upset in RSV. Okay, I thought I, I saw a translation that had it all upset. Well, some Bibles do, even if I can't name any particular translations off the top of my head, because on the grounds that um, the, the, the wording, that there, there's a, a rhythm in the Greek that, that almost sounds poetic, suggesting to some translators that Peter is somehow quoting a hymn, perhaps, or even something that may have served as a kind of creed in uh, the earliest days of the church. Um, but but there's, there's simply no way to prove that. It's, it's just a, a kind of sense of the matter based on uh, the, the kind of almost a change in the the style of writing at this point, that the, 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 the sentences become shorter, punchier, the, the, the way they are, the way the phrases work in say the apostles of the Nicene Creed, or the way they might work in a hymn. Uh, but uh, that's uh, not, not, not necessarily the case. Okay, so we've got to, uh, oh, and we've got some, um, we've, we've got a quotation here. We've got a quotation. Uh, by his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep. Where's that from? Where, does that ring any bells? Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah what? Or at the very least, what, what, what do we call the chapter from Isaiah that that's from? The suffering servant chapter, which really begins at the very end of 52 and then takes up uh, 53. So if you go to Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 52, and then in, I think it's, what is it, Isaiah 52, 20, no, no. Um, yeah, 13, really. Yeah, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they've not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he's heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, and so forth. Uh, so chapter 53 of Isaiah, you go to almost any Christian gathering, and you read this passage, and you ask what it's about. If they were taught anything at all, they would say, this is about, yeah, Jesus suffering on and, and, and dying on the cross. Uh, in Acts chapter 3, you remember the account of the Ethiopian eunuch? That, that Philip is sent to evangelize. He's traveling back from Jerusalem uh, to Ethiopia, presumably on the road uh, to Gaza. And Philip comes up and says, hey, what are you reading? Because, of course, everybody read aloud back in those days. It's a good, good practice. Uh, and he says, I'm reading from Isaiah. And uh, uh, Philip says, do you understand it? And he says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Explains it to me. And then beginning with this passage, Philip it begins to explain everything concerning the Christ. The thing about this passage, though, is how infrequently it's used in the New Testament. It is quoted very rarely. If you actually trace all the places where it's quoted, it's only a few times, and this is one of them. Chief place where it's used most here in First Peter. Uh, the, the one place in all of the New Testament where this passage forms the backbone of, let's say, the argument that the apostle is making, uh, subsequent Christians 
uh, Christians since the, uh, the New Testament was written have used it a lot more. And one reason why it might not be quoted so much in the New Testament is it didn't need to be. It was known so well. That kind of thing. Uh, so if you look at the passion narratives, for example, in the Gospels, it's very obvious that the evangelists are deliberately choosing details to emphasize that take the hearer or the reader back to Isaiah 53. That, that when, when this particular moment in Christ's suffering, you know, every evangelist has to choose. He can't say everything that happened. He can't cover every single second uh, of, of the time between his arrest and the time he dies on the cross. So he's got to make choices. And that, that so many of the things that are brought out in the Gospels line up with things we read about in Isaiah 53 it, it is, again, a sign that Isaiah 53 is very familiar to the early church. Um, What's its purpose here? <clears throat> Why is Peter quoting this passage? That Christ is our example? Yeah. So he, he's doing something that every good Lutheran seminarian is warned not to do. <laughs> which is to set up Christ's death as an example for us to imitate, okay? Peter might well have failed his preaching exams in, uh, in seminary uh, based on this particular passage. And why is that? What, what, why are, are we Lutherans, uh, uh, let's say, a, a allergic to uh, any kind of preaching that, that sets up Christ as an example for us to follow. The, the reason is that before the Reformation, in the late Middle Ages, Christ began to be nothing but an example. He was reduced to being only an example for us to follow. Uh, and so you had this long tradition uh, where Jesus' suffering and death were, were for us simply the model for the rest of us to imitate. Here's what Jesus did. This is what Jesus wants you to do too. And there's even a Protestant version of that in our own day. And I hope you've never heard something like this from the pulpit here, but look at all that Jesus did for you. What have you done for him lately? See? Uh, look at the enormous suffering he went through. Now, what are you going to do in return? Uh, if this is how much he loves you, how much are you loving him back? I, I hope that look on your face is, is telling me that that is such a strange thing to hear you say, Pastor McGuire, that, uh, that, that we've never heard it here in this, uh, in this church. I hope not, uh, because Christ is first and foremost not an example for us to follow. He is first and foremost our Savior. He is first and foremost the one who does everything that he does in our place for us, to save us. Um, so what, what, is, what is the danger of only hearing Christ as an example for us to follow? Yeah, it, it, it becomes an, an impossible order to keep or an impossible recipe to, to, to follow. Yeah, it, it's, it's like, uh, you know, Jesus is not the, the drill sergeant who says to his men and women, uh, I'm going to show you this only once. So you better pay attention so you get it right from here on out. Uh, uh, and he takes a rifle and he shoots it and then says, now you do it just like that. Okay. No, what, what Jesus is doing, this is his work for us before we were even born. Uh, that, 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 that he's doing all these things for us because we can't do them 
Uh, it's like Pastor Dalthwaite says in the, in the sermon today that, that, that if all Jesus came to do was, was give us bread, then why is he ever on the cross? If, if we can do this ourselves and just need an example, then what's the point of him hanging suspended on the cross? Uh, that being said, there is an important element of imitation and example in what Jesus did. And there are many ways, many different ways people bring this out. Think of the Beatitudes, right? So, so go back to, to Matthew chapter five, the beginning of the, the Sermon on the Mount. So the Beatitudes, and remember, he's teaching his disciples. These are those who believe in him. That is his audience. But uh, beginning in verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, uh, and so forth. And it's not very difficult to see how all those descriptions apply particularly well to Jesus. Who is more poor in spirit than Jesus who emptied himself to become our servant? Who has mourned like Jesus mourned? Who is meek like Jesus is meek? Remember he says in Matthew 11, uh, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for I am meek and lowly. I am meek. Uh, uh, who hungered and thirsted for righteousness more than Jesus? Who is purer in heart than Jesus? Who is a greater peacemaker than Jesus who came to bring about peace between God the Father and us sinners? You, you see that? Um, so all of these things apply first and foremost to Jesus. But Jesus is addressing these things to his disciples, which is us. And so he doesn't just go and do all the hard work and say, now you can take your seats on the conveyor belt and wait until it brings you to the, you know, to the, to the top. No, he calls us to be members of his kingdom and to participate in the life of the kingdom, which his life becomes the model of. For his earning our forgiveness, pure gift is what gets us into the house. But once in the house, we now live in a certain way. We live in the way that Jesus lives, modeled for us by his earthly ministry, his life and death and resurrection. Do you follow that? So, so I, Peter ought to still get an A for, for, for his preaching. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it's kind of like, this is what I've done. Uh, or, or, or the Protestant, again, the, the, the Protestant version of the, the imitation of Christ in the Middle Ages uh, error is, this is what I've done, now it's your turn. No, 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 he came to rescue us from that life that was waging war against our soul. Remember how Peter puts it, to fight against sin. Uh, that that, that with, whether you fight back or not, sin's fighting against you. And so he's rescued us from that life. And, and now what does he do? He teaches us a better way. That's exactly how Paul puts it, leading into the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians. You know, I, but, but I teach you a better way. You know, you, you, you're now in the house. Uh, you, 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 how about this for an analogy? You know, let, let's say you... you you, you've got these, these orphans next door who, who have no one to care for them, uh, no, no one to, to teach them right from wrong, uh, uh, no, no one to, to protect them from, from harm, and, and, and you decide out of the goodness of your heart to take them in. It's kind of like, uh, like the end of Peter Pan, right? right uh, the, the lost boys, they, they get adopted right at, at the end. Now, now the, 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 the lost boys are, are, why do they now belong to the, the Deerings, right? The Deerings family? I, I should know this. I've been on a Disney boat for a week. <laughs> uh, but, but Peter Pan wasn't, wasn't uh, didn't, didn't boom as large as you think he would. Um, uh, 
they're, they're, they're in the house. They're part of the family solely because mom and dad have decided to adopt them. But now that they're in the home, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be a taught a different way to live than, than they knew before this. They're, they're living this new way has nothing to do with their being in the house or not. That has everything to do with the, the, the choice and the love of, of the parents that adopted them. But now that they're in the house, you know, mom and dad aren't going to let them, you know, live in a way that's harmful for them the way they were, but it's going to teach them a new way. Because uh, if you live the old way instead of the new way, you're waging war against your own soul. You're pushing against God rather than receiving his embrace. Um, they think of the, the second article of the creeds, meaning the catechism, right? Christ did all these things for us. He ransomed us. He redeemed us to poor lost creature, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and life. That what? For what per what end? To what end? <laughs> that I may that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lived and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. true. But uh, you know, what, one of the striking things then uh, about the catechism itself and, and, and Luther's choices in, in giving us these explanations is when, when you think about it, the place that sanctification shows up, sanctification, the, the way we use the word today, not the way the catechism itself uses the word, but sanctification being a, a shorthand for the, the life the Christian leads now that he's in a saved position. Where does it show up? It shows up in the article about Jesus, not the article about the Holy Spirit. I, isn't that interesting? I, I find it interesting. <laughs> but in other words, you would expect, okay, we've got an article about Jesus, we've got an article about the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll say the sanctification stuff, meaning how we're supposed to live and act as Christians when we get to the Holy Spirit. But no, that shows up in the article about Christ, that he's ransomed us, he's rescued us from sin, death, and the power of the devil, but for a purpose, not just to rescue us, but also to place us in a better position of living a godly life, a life of love and service. And that's all in the second article. Third article, it's all about the Holy Spirit creating faith. Right? That, that how are we holy before God? We are covered with Christ's righteousness, which we receive by faith, which itself is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So the third article is the way we use the words today. The third article is all about justification still. It's only in the second article that we get justification and sanctification. Um, so he's accomplished this reconciliation for us, Christ has, between us and God the Father. Uh, he says, trust me, I know the Father. Now watch me, and if you do this too, you will also benefit from living this way, and this too will please the Father as I have pleased him. He knows how to live. We don't. And so he teaches us. The whole of Jesus' life, from his incarnation to his uh, ascension, it's set before us as a template for us for the perfect life. Uh, and so we, 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 we find in Paul and Peter and James and John that, that they're not worried about using these great gospel truths of the incarnation and of the atonement as examples as well. Um, Paul too would have plumped preaching class. Because what does he do in, in the great uh, kind of a, a ascension section of or exaltation section of Philippians chapter two? Go to Philippians chapter two. Now, this one's even more likely to be set apart in your Bibles as um, resembling something like a poem or a hymn or a creed. This is Philippians chapter 2. Mm 
And that's hard to do this with one hand on St. Patrick here. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry, St. Let's take a back seat. Philippians 2, and it says here, um, this is the, I hope this is, is familiar to you all, where, where Paul says, beginning, let's say, in um, verse 6, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, wonderful gospel passage. This is what Jesus has done. He humbled himself, emptied himself to the point of death, becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so that now with his exaltation, right, every knee will bow uh, at the name of Jesus. But why does Paul bring this fact in? Why does Paul tell us these things? Right before, in verse 5, it says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's using it as an example. Be humble as your Lord is humble. Here's how humble the Lord is. He, he had a palace in heaven. And he gave that up to become a slave to you. Becoming obedient to his father, even to the point of death. And so that now that we who are already in Christ, which is yours. You know, you don't have to work at getting this. You already have it, Paul says. This is your mind in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind is Christ? This is the kind of mind Christ has. It's a mind of humility. It's a mind that counts other people's needs greater than, than one's own and so forth. So, so Paul, too, is, is using uh, Jesus' incarnation and his, his resurrection and ascension as, as a template uh, for, for us to, uh, to learn from and imitate. Um, so, uh, we ought to have the same mind, but we can't. And that's why we have to be told again and again and again. Uh, and yet we're not going to enter into God's heaven depending on whether our life was perfect or not. That's the good news in all this. Uh, so, uh, because again, it, it's 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 the love of the Father that we return to again and again. That that is it, it is the reason we're in the house to begin with, not whether or not we make our bed perfectly each and every day. Fair enough. Uh, so and, and so likewise, uh, you know, the, the parent, right? The, in, in in the like the darings, you know, the the, the parent isn't going to show. Uh, love only once to, to the, the, the newly adopted children, but is going to show love again and again and again. Uh, a, a parent is going to, uh, in our own raising of our own children, right? We don't just you know, show them once and then every time they mess up after that, punish them, right? We show them again and again, but we also love them again and again and again. Uh, we love them again and again for, for 18 years, show them uh, how to do things uh, for, for 18 years and may even nag them about those same things after that. <laughs> so, so I've heard that this happens. That, that's so, but this is what love, love does. Um, and if my telling you, you know, let, let's, let's say, you know, here, here is Peter as an apostle of Christ telling you in with Christ's authority Here's what Christ would have you do. If his telling you makes no difference, what does that suggest about your faith in Christ to begin with? See, it should make a difference. Just as if you as a child are told again and again by your parent, please do this or please do that. 
if, if the being asked by your parent makes no difference whatsoever in your life, there's something wrong with that relationship between the child and the parent. Um, so, um, you know, if, if uh, you know, if, if I told you, you know, right now, uh, stand up and, and touch the ceiling with both hands, okay? You, you can't do it, right? But you're going to want to if Jesus is the one doing the asking. How, how, how's that? As, as a kind of uh, analogy that, that, that covers, quote, the fact that this is real, this is a, 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 a genuine expectation, and yet it's one that we can't possibly meet uh, this side of glory. Yeah. What's that? I guess, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. What, what, what if you, but you can't stand on the counter. <laughs> so God, and God telling us to do these things is not what enables us to do them. You know, we're, we're right back into that discussion of the, the, the law can never bring about that which it demands from us. All the law can ultimately do is show us our inability to do it, right? The gospel is the power that, that enables us to do what, what God asks of us. And so, um, uh, so uh, God forgiving us, giving us the gospel, that's the strength, that's the energy that enables us to fight against sin and to struggle against our temptations. And this is what the, the letter is all about, right? Remember the, the phrase earlier, the passions of the flesh. Uh, they war against us. They wage war against us. So what do we do? We fight back. We make a conscious effort. And, and this is actually where we cooperate with God in a way we don't when it comes to being saved in the first place. He saves us without our own effort. But when it comes to living a life according to his will, we do work with God. God's told us what we want. We try to do it. If we can't, that's okay. God still forgives us, but we keep trying to do it. Uh, you know, imagine a child for the first time. Uh, it, it's it's uh, my wife's birthday today, and so I wouldn't be surprised if if uh, if Aaron tries to make breakfast for her this morning. How do you think that's going to turn out? It, it's not going to turn out well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and that's all right. That's all right because what's all important is the relationship between mom and daughter. You see. And over time, Aaron's going to get better at, at, at the making of the breakfast. But, but the making of the breakfast isn't the grounds for the relationship, you see. And yet, it's still something a child in a good relationship with a parent is going to want to do. Okay. Uh, and, and all of this, it's, it's a very difficult part. I, I brought this up last week about that, that early founding pastor of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in that collection of lectures he gave on the distinction between law and gospel and how it's it's the most difficult part in the Christian life of, of properly distinguishing between law and gospel because we are always tempted uh, to, to take our performance and and turn it in into the grounds on which uh, on which God loves us or favors us. See, uh, we, 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 we take the good work that, we, that, that we, we manage to pull off only with God's help and turn around and say, ah, oh, God, did you see what I just did? What, now what do I get for it? That, that kind of thing. So, so every good work that we do becomes in the next moment a temptation to trust in it. When we know all along the only thing we should trust in is Jesus. See? Um, or, or the, 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 the other part is anytime Jesus comes to us and asks us to do something, we, we react with, I can't, or I haven't until now, that's for sure. And, and your conscience immediately, immediately starts accusing you. And should your conscience accuse you? Not in Christ, because Christ has already answered for all your sin. Christ has already answered for all your shortcomings, you see? And so always keeping law and gospel in the proper place. Okay, so 
in 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Um, fear here, let's see, uh, we get uh, subject. Well, uh, well let's start with this. this. The servants were the slaves. Okay. Uh, he's addressing slaves. And, and it, it's going to be helpful to recognize from the very beginning that the, the slaves issue, it, it comes with a lot of baggage because we have a very different experience of slavery in our more modern North American context than uh, a, a Peter writing in a, a first century uh, Roman colony. Uh, that uh, slavery was pretty much the way of life. This, this was the, uh, this is how the economy ran. Uh, don't want to give a, go back too far. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, the, 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 the terrible devastation wrought by the second Punic War, you know, the one with Hannibal and the elephants. Uh, that, 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 that in the end of that, at the end of that, uh, uh, Italy and, and, and much of the, the, the Roman Empire was uh, destroyed and ravaged and, and impoverished, and and the, the way of rebuilding depended in large part uh, no longer on a kind of farmer soldier class, uh, but but now on slaves, slaves. Uh, imported from the, the, the conquered lands of the Roman Empire, uh, who, who, who then you know, served as either uh, uh, workers in the field, workers in the home, uh, worst of all, workers in the mines. Um, but the, there's a, a great variety uh, in the employment of the slaves. There was also, and it, and it was not racially grounded, uh, unlike our, our North American uh, context. And, and slaves could end up serving pretty much in any occupation that you can imagine, uh, save that of serving in public office. Slaves would work alongside free people in their occupations. You went to see a doctor. Odds are your doctor was a slave, a well-educated one. Uh, some slaves were used as the tutors and the teachers. Uh, but uh, you know, some slaves had, relatively speaking, not that bad of a life, especially if you lived in the household uh, and, and, and were a member of the household, uh, you know, with, with sleeping in the same house as the master. Uh, so as hard as it is for us this side of the, you know, the, the experience in the South with, with slavery, uh, to, to hear words like this, slaves be subject to your masters, uh, we, we should recognize that, that it was different in, in many important respects. It was also possible to be free as a Roman slave. Now, of course, it was left to the master to do this, but this did happen. Masters would manumit their slaves. Uh, it was also the case that for reasons of debt, people would sell themselves into slavery. They would choose to be slaves. Uh, and, and sometimes only temporarily until the debt was paid, that kind of thing. But you have, you have all this uh, variety. It's also the case, uh, I was reading that by the end of the Republic era of Rome, so you know, uh, early 20s BC, uh, the ratio of slave to free person in Italy was one to three. At, at one point in the, the late Republic, uh, it was proposed in the Senate that slaves be forced to wear different clothes than free people. And it was voted down quite uh, uh, strongly. Why? Because we dare not let the slaves know how numerous they are. <laughs> you see, yeah, if they got wind of the fact that uh, that, that, that there's many more of them than, uh, uh, than, than, than led to believe, then we're, we're all in trouble, that kind of thing. So um, 
slaves be subject to your masters. And it says, with all fear. Now, fear, you, you, you've got respect. Yeah. With all respect, okay. Uh, it's it, same word that, that elsewhere in the New Testament is, is the word for fear, phobia. Uh, but it doesn't mean here terror in the sense of being afraid of the dark or of heights. Uh, uh, just like the fear of God doesn't mean terror before God, but it, it's a fear in which you appreciate uh, God's holiness, God's power, God's will, so that you want to stay on the right side of it. And I think we can all appreciate that as, as children to our parents, maybe especially dad is like this. You fear dad. Not in the way that you're, you're in, you live in terror of him, but when mom says, we'll deal with this when your dad gets home, okay, that packs a punch, right? That, that, that's, you know, one of the worst things you can hear is a little, oh dear, right, right? But you, you don't, because of that, you don't also, fear doesn't replace love, they, they go together. You, you still love dad, you know dad loves you, but you also know You've done something that that displeases dad, and there will be consequences, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so may, maybe a nice distinction would be between living in fear and fearing. We don't live in fear of God, but we do fear God. Does that make sense? Um, that fear, this kind of fear, can live comfortably with love. We fear and love God so that. As, as all the explanations to the commandments began. Uh, and, and we love and fear him because we stand in recognition of knowing that we have a place in his house. Uh, so in, in, in this case, we're not talking about a, a, a fear relationship with God, but one between servants and masters. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip over. I was going to break down the, you know, you have a couple of different words for, for servant. And, and, and again, this, this is, this is doulos. This is, this is the slave word, not the word that in other places can get translated servant, but maybe it's better for us to translate as minister, a minister of the word, servant of the word, uh, that, 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 that's a different word than, than is used here. This is definitely a reference to, you know, actual slaves, slaves be subject uh, to your masters. Um, now, one, one last thing to say, I suppose, about all this is that uh, what, what, what played more of a role in the uh, eradication of slavery in so many parts of the world than anything else? Christianity. 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 Uh, it, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the subversiveness of this passage in a second. Uh, you, you at first blush think, well, you know, here, here's the Bible condoning slavery, endorsing slavery. And, and yet there are elements even here where it definitely works against the grain. Uh, words in Paul work against this. You know, you know the, the Philemon letter to Onesimus. Uh, you, you certainly have um, Paul in one list condemning slave traders as, as ones who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, slave trading, not necessarily slave owning, um, but you can see when Christianity becomes dominant in the West, it's going to be harder and harder to reconcile equally made in the image of God with owning another person as property. Mm -hmm. See? Um, uh, I know there's also a context in here because He's been talking to us about submission, like being humble and submitted to to the government, to and when he's cruel. So it follows this because then it's a well, might of reverence or uh, in fear of all, not only those who are good, but also who are cruel. Right. So it's 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 also in this context of whatever your position in society is, we are to submit to authority the same way God submitted. Yes, right. And so what we have here is what we would call the doctrine of vocation, that, that we are Christians. And in Christ, by virtue of our baptism, we are all equal. There's neither male nor, nor female, slave nor free uh, uh, in, in, in God's eyes through Christ. And yet we still live in this world where 
these, these hierarchical structures are set up, are established to maintain, as we talked about last week, order and peace. And so the Christian doesn't, on the basis of his being a Christian, step out of that good order that God has established for this world, but stays in it, submits to it, submits or, or, or finds uh, meaning and significance in that place. Um, and, and you're exactly right. You anticipate yet a third, you know, he, he's going to move from government, uh, uh, slaves and masters, and then wives and husbands. He's going to use the same word in all three contexts. And, and, and we want to explore that some more. But no, that, that, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. To, to see that connection with what's come before with respect to government. And, and just as we, 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 we honor the government or we are submissive to the authorities, not because of the person, but because of the office, right? He doesn't say fear Nero. He says fear the emperor, be submissive to the emperor. Uh, it, it, it's not because of who Nero is as a person, but because of the office, the authority he's been given by God. And, and so likewise, uh, to translate it to our own time, we're talking employees and employers. Uh, so... Um, now, um, and, and think about how radical that is, though. I mean, the, the slaves have been told that they are equal with their masters in Christ. That's, that's a pretty radical thing to hear at the time that this was first written. Uh, Even in here in the U.S., we have these discussions, or are they slaves human? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, and, and, and clearly Peter is treating them as more than property because he's addressing them. I mean, I mean, think about this. Paul Paul runs into this in, in, in First Corinthians. You've got the table fellowship business, and, and 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 the whole scandal of when they gather for the Lord's Supper, the, the rich are, are, are draining the cup. So that by the time the poor, their servants, their slaves show up. And why are they late? Because they're cleaning the house for the masters who are free to come early. Right? Uh, they show up and there's nothing for them. And, and Paul says that this cannot be. This, this is a, a complete uh, contradiction of their identity in Christ as, as one. So that in the church... They are one. That the, these distinctions that, that are maintained in the world outside of the church vanish. You know, I, I've told you this before that um, when, when we pray, I mean, it, it's, it's a long tradition of when, when you pray for the ruler in church, you, 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 you pray for him in his first name. So we pray for Joseph. We pray for Greg. Why? Because to God, their titles don't mean anything. He's no respecter of persons, right? He doesn't look at the face when that, that word for impartiality that's used, you know, God is impartial. Literally, that, that's used to translate the phrase, God does not look at the face. See? So, so when, when we lift up those who are in the, the position of authority over us, we lift them up as equal to us in Christ. Because that's how God sees them. See? Um, so what a what a radical thing that 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 you know that, that the emperor, if if he were, if, if the president were to visit this, that's why I'm an example. Let, let, let's imagine, let, let, let's imagine this this miracle where we get a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod member elected president. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and he visits our church, right? He, he's going to receive communion based on wherever he's sitting in the, in, in the you know, he doesn't get to come up first, right? He's, he's just one of us because he is, right? But when he goes back out there, we still are going to address him as president so-and-so, right? Schmidt, probably, Royce, maybe, <laughs> odds are. <laughs> uh, but uh, but th this is a very radical thing, and, you, and you've got to imagine that, um, you know, like Paul is doing in, in Corinth, as Peter is doing here, he's addressing a congregation that is comprised of both slaves and slave owners. 
So it's not just the slaves that are hearing this. It's the slave owners, the Christian slave owners, who are hearing these words that Peter addresses to the slaves. Um, and, and even today, let's, let's not think ourselves too far removed from this kind of world. All of us look up to someone in our life. And quite a few of us have people in our lives that look up to us. So we, you know, depending where we are, look up and look down both. Even the president is answerable to God for the use of his office or the king or the queen or whatever the, 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 the situation may be, right? There's always someone else to look up to. Uh, and yet there are also those who look up, up to us. What, what is the great temptation of those who have to look up? To, to what was that? To not look back down. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. acknowledge who you are being responsible. Yeah, we're, we're, we're right. Uh, if, if if I'm under someone else's authority, especially as an American, <laughs> right? What, 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 what am I chomping at the bit to do? Take their job. Take their job, <laughs> right? Uh, or, or take my job and shop it, <laughs> right? But in some ways too, you may use it as a way to um, escape uh, accountability. I'm simply, I have no, it is not my fault. I am just following a yeah, 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 yeah. And so right. it also can be used the way to be able to absolve yourself of any responsibility. Right, now let's get to that because that's addressed here in this section. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that hey, I'm just following orders. What, what do we do with that as Christians? But, but the first thing that, that he's addressing is, I think every slave, every servant, every lowly employee is tempted to rebel. And if I'm a Christian, especially, and I, I, I've been told that I've, I've been given a dignity by God himself, that I, I've been made a brother with the Son of God, a sister of the Son of God, then I'm especially now thinking, well, who are you to tell me what to do? I'm God's child. See, and what does he say? No, 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 no. Be subject to your masters with all respect or with all fear. Um, uh, so he's calling them to recognize that if you are a slave, you have a place in a particular household, and now you still act according to that place and not according to how it feels or how you think it will turn out if, if you do something different, right? Again, doctrine of vocation. Uh, children, anybody ever been a child? <laughs> you know how difficult this is, uh, uh, especially when you know your parents are wrong and you're right. My children have the benefit of having parents that are never wrong. <laughs> uh, but when you know better as a child and your parents order you, command you, ask you to do something that you don't see the sense of, you still do it. Um, and because and, when you think about obedience, the, the very act of obedience, obedience is not yet obedience when you agree with what's been asked of you anyway. Obedience is when you're asked to do something that you don't agree with or that you don't see the sense of, right? Um, same, same principle applied in the government section, right? The, the, you know, the government is asking you to do something that, well, I don't really like this. I don't like the way the government's using my money. Well, here's a test of your obedience as a citizen because it's about the office and the authority that God has established for our good. And if that authority relationship breaks down, we talked about this in respect to government last time. Now it's in the household between the servants and the, the master of the house. If that authority relationship breaks down, everything goes with it. I remember hearing a, a guy give a lecture on, uh, on, on kind of the, the educational principles of, 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 a, of a solid school. And, and, and he, I, I forget who he quoted, but it, but it was a good quote. It was, uh, he said, um, uh, order isn't the most important 
uh, element in a good education, right? Uh, but it's the first one, right? That everything is built on that. He's talking about the need for classroom management, that nothing gets accomplished if the kids are out of control. But you've got to have order. And again, it's not that the, the, the ultimate goal of the school is to produce cookie cutter uh, factory robots or something like that. No, 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 you know, we wanna expand their minds and, and encourage creativity and, and all the rest, but none of those other things can happen if the whole day is so full of distractions that nothing ever gets taught. See, gotta, so that authority relationship has to be there. Um, so, Peter goes on, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust, for this is a gracious thing. If you suffered unjustly, what's the first thing to come to your mind or what, what would, would you use to describe such a situation? If you're suffering unjustly, it's not fair. <laughs> You certainly don't think of it as a gracious thing, but Peter says to take this as a gift. Because he says, when mindful of God, here is where it gets subversive. It's a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What's the opposite of sinning? What's the opposite of sinning? Doing, doing good, doing the right thing. What does doing good not mean? Doing, I'm, I'm anticipating the, the, the explanation. You know, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So let's just be clear what Peter is saying here. What is doing good? Not sinning. What is the opposite of not sinning? Or what is the opposite of sinning? It's doing good. So what is he calling on his slaves, the slaves in the congregation to do from time to time? We're, 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 back, we're back to Sarah's uh, point. What will the slaves being mindful of God be forced to do from time to time? Disobey. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think obviously that they're going to be hard cases, but but I think to 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 put things as simply and and um, concretely as possible, when 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 the boss orders you to do something that is unjust, you don't do it. Because we're, we're right back to, to what we, we talked about last week. What did Peter himself say when the, the, the Sanhedrin uh, hauled him and John before them and said, we told you to stop preaching about Jesus? And what was Peter's answer? We must obey God rather than man. So when mindful of God, see, we don't just do everything the, the master tells us to do. Even though that may mean I'm going to get hurt by doing the opposite. But guess who's going to reward you? Guess who's going to bless that? The one who is higher than your master. Yeah. 
unjust being hard, it's not fair to me. Whereas evil is much to me. Yeah, don't do what God is against what God says. Right. Well, injustice here is is referring to it's unjust of the master to punish you for doing something that was right in the first place. See, that's unjust. And yet he's saying, suffer the injustice. In other words, whose favor are you ultimately concerned about? God's. And that may mean in seeking God's favor rather than your master's, the master hurts you. Yeah, yeah Rose. I'm thinking of, I'm trying to remember exactly where in the catechism where it says it's better to obey God rather than man. Only man can kill the body, but God can. Uh, right, yeah, you're, you're putting, yeah. The two, yeah, so the, the, third, the first part's so, Acts 5, and, and, and the other part's towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Right. That, that's right. I couldn't remember. Yeah. Uh, so so we'll, we'll end there. Maybe we we'll end with an example. You know, if your parents tell you, um, brush your teeth. And you just did. Makes no sense to brush them a second time. You know, this close together. You brush your teeth. Go ahead and brush your teeth. Okay. Now, if your parents say, take that toothbrush and poke your sister's eyes out with them. Okay. There you've got to say no. Even though it may mean your, your, your cruel parents are going to do something bad to you. Okay, but we, you, you see, we, we, we don't just do the, I'm just following orders routine. No, we're, we're, we serve mindful of God. And think again, the slave owners are hearing this. The slave owners are hearing Peter tell their slaves to disobey sometimes. This is a radical thing. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to uh, submit to your will uh, willingly and to uh, go all the way to the cross to win for us forgiveness and a place in your kingdom. And we pray that you would keep us uh, mindful of the fact that you have made us your children uh, so that everything that we think and say and do may be to your honor and glory and to the building up of your church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.